So we have just come out of, or we're, we're on the last day of this Christmas season, really. Um, and for many of us, the day after New Year's Day was this return to reality. And so this was the return to that daily grind and uh, toil under the sun. And so if you were to reflect on the last year, in 2018, you would probably agree that it was filled with highs and lows, successes and failures, and times when everything seemed to be working perfectly, and other times when nothing seemed to be going right. And so we would all probably also agree that this year, 2019, will be much of the same. And this is just the nature of life. And so this morning, we get to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. And this is one of the core wisdom books in the Bible. And uh, these wisdom books offer a wise perspective of the patterns of life on earth to help us make decisions about our lives to give the best, best outcome. And so Ecclesiastes describes in this beautifully depressing, yet somehow hopeful manner, the nature of life under the sun. And so it tells us that we ought to expect this next year to be much of the same as we experienced last year with ups and downs, sun and clouds, celebration and mourning. So Ecclesiastes repeats again and again that everything is meaningless or vanity and a chasing after the wind. And so my hope this morning is to turn this dismal message on its head and reveal the hope of this wise perspective given by the teacher of Ecclesiastes. And so I invite you to stand now as you're able, as I read from God's Word. Um, the words that I'm reading will not be projected on the screen. I'm reading from a, a different translation. Um, but it's <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And it says, The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What is the profit to a man in all his labor, which he labors under the sun? A generation passes away, and another generation comes, but the earth stands forever. The sun also arises, and the sun goes hurrying to its place. It arises there again. The wind goes toward the south, and turning around to the north, the wind is a-going around and around, and the wind returns on its circuits. All the rivers are going to the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers are going, there they are returning to go again. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. So for those who are familiar with Ecclesiastes, you will know that some other translations of the, the second verse uh, may come to mind. So for example, the NIV translation of the second verse says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Um, but the translation I read from says, vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And so in the English language, meaningless and vanity have significantly different meanings. If all is meaningless, then all is without purpose. If all is vanity, then all is related to the inflated pride in oneself. And so if we want to understand Ecclesiastes, it's necessary to understand the actual word being used here, which is a Hebrew word that is used 37 times in Ecclesiastes, and this is about half of the times it's used in the Bible. And that word is hevel. And so we could read this second verse as Hevel of hevels, says the teacher. Hevel of hevels, all is hevel. But what does hevel mean? And so in Ecclesiastes, hevel refers to something that is temporary, unsatisfactory, or, or fleeting. Um, and so hevel is actually first used in the book of Deuteronomy to describe idols in the Song of Moses. Uh, it says, they made me jealous with a no god. They made me angry by their hevels or their vanities. And so here, there's this parallelism that clearly means that hevel is referring to an idol. But the teacher in Ecclesiastes is not concerned with idolatry. Though vanity is a form of idolatry, the worship of oneself, and though idolatry is meaningless and, and purposeless, um, 
And though it may provide this kind of temporary bliss that does not provide any lasting satisfaction, idolatry is not the concern of the teacher. But another place that Hevel is used, and this is more closely uh, to its use in Ecclesiastes, is in the book of Job. And so Job had, had suffered and, and lost his children. He had his property demolished, and he was afflicted with sores and boils that covered his face. And he lamented, saying, I am wasting away. I would not live always. Let me alone, for my days are Hevel, or my days are vanity. Or he's saying, let me alone, for my days are but a breath. Right? My days are short. My days will come to an end. And this is an idea that the teacher of Ecclesiastes has in mind. Um, he actually says, as this one dies, so that one dies. Yea, one spirit is to all, so that there is to the man no advantage over the beast, for all is hevel. All go to one place. All are of dust, and all return to dust. And this is because our days are numbered. And so this is an unsatisfactory truth, that our lives are temporary. And so throughout Ecclesiastes, Hevel is a sort of metaphor that is used to describe the unsatisfactory and transitory nature of all earthly things. And so one, one example of this in Ecclesiastes um, is this. There is a Hevel which is done on the earth. There are just men to whom it happens according to the wicked, and there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said that this is also Hevel. So Hevel describes something of this paradoxical nature of life that makes it unsatisfactory. So I think we as human beings have this sense of justice. We, we understand that good things should happen to people who do good, and punishment should come to those who do evil. And Though we have this sense of justice, and though we, we strongly believe that this is how justice ought to be, we don't actually see it play out in our lives in a completely satisfying manner. Where we see some who do evil do get their just punishment on earth, and some who do good do receive abundant blessing on earth. But this is not always the case. Right? There's evil that is left unpunished. Good deeds and hard work go unnoticed. Thieves escape untouched. Homes of the innocent burn to ashes. And so this is something of a paradox that there's, there's justice, but there's not. And so it's unsatisfactory. And this is Hevel. And so when I was first taught the meaning of Hevel in the context of Ecclesiastes, it was described as, as smoke coming out of a pipe. Um, and so if you can imagine, you have a pipe and there's smoke you know, coming out of it. And it spreads and fills the air. But if I reach my hand out to grab it, I, I come up empty-handed. And that's very unsatisfying, right? This is, that's Hevel. Um, Strong's Concordance uh, likens Hevel to cotton candy. And I'm not a big fan of cotton candy, but I can imagine what it's like to eat it. Um, you have this, like, fluffy sugar, and that's why I don't like it. Um, <laughs> it's whirled around this paper cone, and it appears like there's a lot of substance there. But when you grab a handful of it and you put it in your mouth, it just dissolves into, you know, almost nothing. Um, and so that's very unsatisfactory. That is Hevel. And so one of the most difficult parts with preparing this sermon was not coming up with illustrations of Hevel, but actually choosing which illustrations to use, because everything is Hevel. And so as I was preparing this message, I began to see Hevel everywhere, uh, even more so than before. And so I had discovered a version of the solid rock by a group associated with uh, Southern Seminary, um, which this version of the song had a harmony I had never heard before. Um, but then I made the grave mistake of listening to the song over and over again. And I think many of us can relate to that. And so when you listen to it, you know, ten times in a row, it becomes, you know, it's not quite as good and starts to, to fade how, how much you enjoy it and just eventually becomes just a regular song. It may still be, you know, a good song, but it doesn't have that same kind of excitement that you had uh, the first time you hear it. And so that is Hevel. Uh, that is the, the fleeting and, and transitory nature of life. That life under the sun consists of these temporary pleasures which, which fade with the passage of time. 
And so the, the teacher in Ecclesiastes likens many other things to Hevel. His claim is, of course, that all is Hevel. And so throughout Ecclesiastes, we find that work or toil under the sun is Hevel. That the passing down of labor, that when we retire from our work and pass our projects on to someone else, we have no idea if they're going to do a good job on that work or not. And so that is Hevel. That human lives, generations coming and going is Hevel. That the sun rising and setting, the wind blowing, the ri rivers flowing endlessly into the sea but never filling up the sea, that is unsatisfactory or Hevel. That material wealth is Hevel. Uh, the teacher even says that wisdom is Hevel. Here in a wisdom book says wisdom is Hevel. Right? That pain, grief, unrest, justice to the wicked and the righteous, envy and rejoicing are all Hevel. And so this list surely goes on and on. But one final thing to notice here is that both positive and negative events are Hevel. That pain and rejoicing are Hevel. And so the highs and lows of life under the sun are Hevel. The successes and failures of life under the sun are both temporary. So think about it. If, if you receive a job promotion or when you receive an A in a class, you know, three years later, that event seems much less significant than when it first happened. On the other hand, if you're fired from a job or you fail a class, three years later, that event seems much less significant um, than when it first happened. And so successes and failures are heavy. They have a fleeting nature. So as time passes, the events become less and less significant in the present. And so everything under the sun is Hevel. And if I have made you understand Hevel well enough, you will never be able to unsee that everything is Hevel, as was the case for me. But what are the implications of this truth? And if everything is Hevel, what are we supposed to do about our work? Are we to never try to accomplish anything because it's all Hevel? Or are we to just throw our hands up in the air and quit? And so though this truth that everything is Hevel is, is depressing and frustrating, there must be some reason that the teacher felt it so important to emphasize this truth. So I have a few reasons uh, that he likely emphasized this truth. The first is that when we understand that everything is Hevel, it causes us to relinquish control. And so during the holiday season, I am always very impressed with what my mom is able to accomplish. And I have glanced at some of the lists that she makes uh, in her planning, and they are incredibly detailed. Um, she has the exact time that certain vegetables need to be chopped for whatever she's making, uh, when the turkey needs to be put in the oven, and, and many other details. Um, that she probably wouldn't want you to know that are on there. Um, <laughs> I don't know that she knows I've seen her list. Um, but I, I believe that that plan has never followed perfectly, and I, I know that they haven't been. Um, so, like, arrival times may change. Um, the turkey could take longer to cook in the oven. And so this plan that she has cannot be followed uh, in a satisfactory manner because of events beyond her control. And so this is Hevel. It, and it leaves these two options. You can either be frustrated by the Hevel of the situation, you can be frustrated by the changing of plans and the inability to follow this plan to a T, or you can accept that this is Hevel and relinquish control. And you can choose joy instead of frustration, just saying this is okay, this is just the nature of life, under the sun. And so surely relinquishing control is the better option. But does this mean that we should never plan? No. <laughs> but understanding that everything is Hevel leads us to plan in light of Hevel. We're prepared to go off script and enjoy this life, enjoy our toil under the sun, even when our plans break down. And so instead of being frustrated, we can acknowledge that somehow God is working in the midst of this Hevel. Uh, for the teacher says, as you do not know the path of the wind, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. And so the second thing that understanding that everything is Hevel does, is it leads us to live a balanced life. And so the teacher is concerned with this balance of work and, and rest. And so should we work hard to try to be promoted in our job? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should we put in long hours of studying and try to get A's in school? Absolutely. 
But we should, we should not do this without being sure to also enjoy life and being sure to rest. And so there's this, this short poem or riddle in Ecclesiastes that I think illustrates this point um, quite nicely. Um, and the, the riddle is this. The fool folds his hands together and eats with his own flesh. Better is a palm filled with rest than two fists with labor and striving after the wind. And so there are three kind of postures that are given in this riddle. And the first is, is something like this, where you have your arms crossed, and you can imagine just kind of laying on your back in this position. And so this is the posture of a fool, right? There's no work that gets accomplished if your arms are crossed and your hands are inactive, right? And so the fool does not work at all, but we were created to work. The second posture here is kind of these grabbing fistfuls. So it's two hands that are just reaching out like this and grabbing or striving after wind, you could say. But this is also an undesirable posture because it represents one who is working strenuously, not taking the time to rest, and filling all their time with labor and striving after the wind. But we also know that we were created with a need for rest. And so there's one optimum posture that's given here. And it looks something like this. You have one fist closed and one palm that's open. And so one palm is for work and the other is for rest. But this doesn't mean that you just give a half-hearted effort in your work or in your studies. But it means that when you work hard, you make sure that there is time to also rest from your toil under the sun. And so this actually illustrates that paradoxical nature of Hevel. Right? We should work hard, but not too hard. And we should rest, but not too much. And so it's in that balance that we actually will most enjoy our toil under the sun. And so finally, when we begin to see and believe that everything under the sun is truly Hevel, then we begin to seek some true and lasting satisfaction. We begin to seek something that is not fleeting. We begin to seek some work that will actually last instead of work that just gets passed on to another when we pass away. And we have been designed with eternity on our hearts. Right? The teacher says God has set eternity in the human heart. And so the brilliance of the teacher's teaching is this. Right? Through these metaphors and images of this cyclical, unsatisfactory nature of life, right, that generations come and go, that the sun rises and sets only to rise again, that the wind blows south, then north, only to blow south again, that all the rivers flow into the sea, and yet the sea is somehow never full, we see that with the passage of time, much of our toil loses its meaning. And this message is intended to put us down in the dumps and to, to frustrate us, because when we see that this message is true, the natural response that God has wired us for is to escape all this meaningless and transitory, unsatisfactory, fleeting hevel of life. And so that is what leads our hearts to the ultimate satisfaction, the complete unhevel or anti-hevel, who is Jesus Christ. And so this true satisfaction, this escape from hevel, can only be found in Christ. In his birth, Christ satisfied the need for a deliverer from the evil on earth. And though Jesus did not deliver through the expected means, his birth, about which angels sang, and this boy whom shepherds and wise men traveled far to meet, fulfilled the promise that a Messiah would come and deliver his people from evil. In his life, Christ satisfied the perfect requirement of the law that we could never uphold. And so by living a life of perfect obedience and submission to the Father, he made himself an acceptable substitutionary sacrifice before God for our sins. In his death, Christ satisfied the wrath of God. And though we deserve the wrath of God, Jesus endured that wrath on our behalf for the wrongs we committed. In his resurrection, Christ satisfied the hope of eternal life. His resurrection confirmed that he was truly the Son of God, providing a hope that we too may someday be resurrected with him, raised to eternal life with him. And in his return... Christ will satisfy all things to their ultimate completion or end. 
And so those who believe will be made complete in Christ, finally being glorified with him. Justice will be fulfilled when Christ judges the deeds of all men according to his true and right and perfect judgment. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain. And all who believe will enjoy eternal life and eternal bliss in the presence of God, finally seeing the Lord face to face. And so the book of Ecclesiastes closes with, with these words. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And so we do have a purpose amidst this hevel of life, to fear God and keep his commandments, to look to Christ and obey his teaching and his leading. Our purpose comes when Christ becomes part of our life under the sun. It is Jesus who we must receive by if we desire to enter into eternal life with him. It is Jesus who we call Lord and to whom we relinquish control. It is Jesus whose sight we, we trust through the trials of life. It is Jesus who satisfies all of our longings amidst this world of heaven. This world where everything seems to fall short, where our expectations are never fully met, and where our desires are never fully satisfied. It is Jesus who satisfies. It is Jesus who satisfies. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, sending your Son into the world. Um, Lord, that we would be uh, just saved through, through your love and through uh, your grace. And Lord, that all of our longings would be satisfied uh, in Christ. And so Lord, as uh, we uh, just start to see all of this, this hevel in the world, Lord, would you teach us to look to you for that true satisfaction Lord, that we would find joy under the sun and seeking your presence and grace and joy daily. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.